If I read something wrong, please help me out. My eyes aren't working real well today. Because my last class, we got all messed up. And nobody, everybody was just sitting there looking at me. I'm writing down the wrong numbers and everything. And they tell me once we get the whole problem done. You wrote down the wrong numbers. You tell me that earlier. Uh, so just looking down there at that histogram. First of all, z-scores, remember z-scores look something like this. If, if we were going to do a little graph, z-scores always zero in the middle, one, two, three, and z-scores just a standardized score. It's a, you change everything in the z-scores so that you can compare all the scores no matter what the scores are. So on this one, look at that histogram. Uh, Z, Z score of zero, which letter is that going to be? Which one's right in the middle? B. 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 And then a Z score of 2.14. C. That's, uh, that's way over here, right? Somewhere on the 78 or something on, on the, I don't have my history, but it's way over here. On about 78, so that'd be C. And then a Z score of negative 1.43 is going to be on this side somewhere. So that's the A, right? About 53. Was there anywhere we had to change stuff into a Z score? Those are the ones I'd rather do. Yeah, those are not the ones from. Is that like 39 and stuff? I don't remember which ones we had to do, but let's look at 39 through 42. I think those are changing things to z-scores, aren't they? Yeah. Let's just look at 39. Uh, for the statistics test, scores in exercise 37, the mean is 63. So our X bar is 63. Standard deviation is 7.0. Uh, standard deviation, that's S, 7.0. Uh, and the biology test score is an exercise 38. So that was for, what was that? That was statistics test. So this stuff is for the stats test. And then we have for the biology test. The mean is 23. 23? Yeah. So X bar is 23. And what's the standard deviation? 3.9. Yep. Now what, what we have with this and I'm going to draw all this. This doesn't really do anything for the problem, and the problem is going to be easier than what I'm going to make it out to be, but I want you to know how to do all this stuff. If we were going to draw just a little number line graph for this, you put the mean right in the middle. We go out three standard deviations each way, because that's where 99.9% .9 of the data falls. For 63 and 7.0, it's not too hard. Going out this way, you just add the standard deviation each one. So this would be 70, that's 77, that's 84. Just adding 7.0 each time. On this way it'd be at 56, 49, 42. This has got to match up to, for Z scores, if we were doing Z scores, these are the raw scores. Raw scores is just what you have, the actual scores. Alright? Z scores what you do to them once you try to make them standardized so you can compare them to everything else. Well, if this is our mean 63 on the z-score number line, that's going to match up to zero. And as we go out this way, instead of going up by sevens each time, on the z-score it's just one, two, and three. So if you had a score 
on the stats test of an 84, your Z score would be a 3. If you had a score of 63 on the stats test, your Z score would be a 0. And then the same thing back this way. That's negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. If we're looking at the other one, for the raw scores, the mean is 23. Go out three standard deviations, three standard deviations. Might need some help with the calculator here. Here, this way, we're going to add 3.9, so that's 20, 26.9. Add another 3.9, that's 30.8, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Add another 3.9, that would be 34.7. We'll go out the other way. I didn't give myself enough space here. What is that, 19.1, is that right? Yeah. Subtract the, another 3.9, and that would be 15.2. And subtract another 3.9. Uh, somebody help me out, so I don't have to think so much. 11.1. 11 if we match that up with the z-score chart, zero is going to be right here at 23. That's one. That's two. That's three. That's one. That's two. That's three. Oops, those are negative. Now, what we can do with this, and the reason that we have z-scores and, and other scores T-scores and stuff that we'll talk about later on in the year. If you scored a 77 on the stats test and you score a 32 on the biology test and we're looking at those numbers, which test did you do better on? It's sort of hard to compare them looking at them this way, right? And that's why we change them into z-scores. Well, if we're looking at z-scores for a 77, that's going to be here, so that's going to be a z-score of 2. And for the biology, a 32 would be somewhere like out in here, right? And that's going to be a z-score of what? 2 point something. Which one did you do better on then? Biology. You did a little better on the biology. All right, so you can actually compare them. But when we're looking at them in the raw scores, you can't really compare them. You can't say, oh, I did much better on the biology, because it just doesn't make sense. So that's why we use these scores. <laughs> uh, let's see, on 39 it says, you got a 75 on the one test, on the stats test. And you got a 25 on the biology test. So those are your raw scores, 75 and 25. You go home and you tell your parents, they ask you, what'd you get on the stats test today? And you say a 75. They're probably going to say, really, that's a C. And maybe, maybe not be so thrilled with you, but they probably won't yell at you. Then you tell them, they ask you, what's your score on the biology test? And you say a 25, they're probably going to do what? They're going to yell at you and say, you score what? That's like a Q or something, isn't it? So they're going to yell at you for that, even though you can't really compare the two. Uh, does anybody have the formula right there? What do you do to find the Z score? Right x bar, that's the mean over standard deviation. What's the value we're dealing with on our score for this one? 75. So it's 75 minus what was the mean? 63. Divided by the standard deviation was 7.0. What is it? I uh, you know what you're doing wrong. I'm just rolling it once. Divide it first. 
please be careful with this. When you're doing this, listen closely right here because a lot of a lot of students do this, and I forgot to say it last time. When you do this formula, subtract these two, hit equals on your calculator, then hit divided by. Because otherwise the calculator takes this number and divides it by this, then subtracts. So if you get a number that's not between negative four and positive four, you messed up punching it into your calculator. 1.7. 1.7. So 1.71. Usually with Z scores, we go out two places behind the decimal. Usually with Z scores, we go out two places behind the decimal. So on this one, our Z score, the value that we're looking at is 25. The mean was 23. And the standard deviation was 3.9. that gives? 0 0.51. 0 0.51. So our Z score for this one, 0.51. Okay, so what do we need all of the graphs to determine? You didn't, you didn't really need them, that was just me explaining it. So you just need the? Just need the values, okay. this, this, and the value that they said that you want to change. So all we're doing, Michael, is is we're taking that 75, that's the, that's the score, the raw score, and we're changing it into a Z score. This right here is all you really need. The only reason I did all this stuff was so that you could sort of picture what we're actually doing. So we're changing from this scale to this scale. So if I look at 75 on here, 75 on here would be somewhere like in here, right? Well, then that means it, it should line up somewhere right down in there, which my graphs don't line up exactly like they should, but so we should be pretty close. And if we look at 25 over here, that's gonna fall somewhere about here. Well, then that should fall on the Z scale, that should be somewhere about in there. <coughs> now you look at this and you wanna compare those two. Which test did you do better on? You were farther over to the right for the stats test than you were for the biology test. So now we can actually compare those and say, and if you told your parents you got these scores, then you could say, what's true about this Z score? It's what? It's to the right scale. So it's above average. average. It's above average because 23 is the mean. So you scored higher than at least 50% of the other people. So when you're making that argument, you can say, but I scored higher than most of the people. Uh, would either one of these two be unusual? Uh, to be unusual again, if you're above two standard deviations or over, you're unusual. If it's from two to three, it's unusual if it's anything above three, where Eversol, Eversol scores that all the time, then it's very unusual. Then you got these people over here, not putting no names here, <coughs> but those are very unusual also, but to the wrong side. Does that make any sense? We're going to use Z scores a lot throughout the year. Change them. Uh, I actually think, I'm trying to think, I think there's a way on the calculator. Grab your calculators out and help me out. I think there's a way on the calculator. It'll change a standard score into, or a raw score into a Z score. But I don't remember how to do it. Um, go to stats and go over to calculate and let's scroll down that doesn't look like that's it uh, let's see
go to, does everybody see the math button on their calculator? Math. If I search through there, no, I don't see nothing under there either. Uh, I never really cared about it because to do it, this isn't a hard formula. You just got to know, you take the number you're looking at minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. That's pretty easy. On the calculator, what you have to do is you have to find the right spot and go to it. And then just like when putting in the list, it, it'll ask you some questions and you got to type in the mean, standard deviation, and the score and then do it. Well, you might as well just use the formula because it's not saving any typing or anything and this isn't a real difficult formula. Uh, I couldn't find it on there. I can't remember what's that. Huh? You're on your bag. You're what? Does. All, all those are four. All that's for is to put in that. It's like a button on so that you can put that in on your screen to type in something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's how it is. It's just as easy to do the formula. Other questions on that page? <coughs> What's going to be on your test? I'm trying to think. Let me see how I got this set up. What's going to be on your test? I'll give you a second. This is what to know for the test. Make a frequency distribution uh, and a frequency histogram. You write down what you think you need to write down. Don't try to copy every single thing. It won't, it won't work. Your guys' phones are your 
Are you, does your voicemail on your phone like hook up to your email? Is that, must be something to do with these voicemails on these new phones that, that hooks to the email and sends you a message. I don't like the new phones. I don't either. I, I think again, because Mrs. The Barnes' kids come in here and play with my phone all the time and I don't care. But there's supposed to be a button pushed that allows the office to call me. And I think it, I, I pushed it so that, but I think it's unpushed now and I don't remember which button it is. So, so they can't call me. So they can't call me now. <laughs> I don't like the, like you can't hear them. When they ring, it's just like, you gotta go pick up the phone. Yeah. Started here, they were down the office. I know they were cussing and stuff. Well, I'm you know not there, but they're stupid. Every so won't pick up his phone. I'm standing up here, and it gives you. By the time I venture my way back to do the desk, it's already rang. It's already rang three times, and it's done. So you hear like a dead spread. Right. right. You gotta stop. As soon as you hear, and if I'm standing out in the hallway. Oh, yeah. There's no way. And they, they think that I'm just doing it on purpose. <laughs> I mean, I probably think the same thing. Yeah, so I, I, I don't blame them for thinking that, but I'm not. All right, so be able to make a frequency distribution chart <coughs> with the frequency distribution chart. This is probably the most important thing. and. The, uh, Michael just said that he didn't do very well on that quiz. You got to be able to do this. For a frequency distribution, remember you got to find the class width. You got to find the class width first. The way you find the class width is you take the highest number minus the lowest number and divide by the number of classes that you want. Any problem on the test, I'll tell you how many classes you want. <coughs> Once we find the class width, remember your frequency distribution looks like this. You got your classes here. Then you may have a tally chart. Then you have your F, which is your frequency. Let's say we want four classes this time. Somebody give me a, the highest number in our setup. 72. Give me the lowest number. 16. All right, start. What did you say, Riley? 30. 30. And we want four classes. Somebody help me out. What's 72 minus 30? 42. 42. What's 42 divided by 4? 10.5. What do we do with that? Always round it up. So the class width is going to be 11. <clears throat> when we start our classes over here, Watch, again, watch closely on this, because if I put this on there, it would be just like that quiz, and this one problem probably be worth like 20 points or something. All right? So what number do we start with? 30. We start with the lowest number. That goes right there. Then you go down, you find your lower class limits, all your lower class limits, and we add 11 each time. So we've got 30 there, then what? 41. 52, 63, and that's all, the, if we only want four classes, that's as far as we go. How do we know what this number is? All right, what's this one gonna be? 51, then what? 62, and then for the last one, we just add the class width to this, which is gonna make it at? 73. Then you go through whatever your list is. <coughs> yeah, you'll have your list here. Oops, I can't be 85. 
I don't know, you know, whatever the uh, list is, all the way out. And you just go through here and you put in tally marks until you get them all. And then out here, your frequency, you just tell how many, oops, how many were in each one, so on and so on. You're going to make a histogram. For the histogram, you probably want to do the midpoint of the class. So to find the midpoints, we just add these two numbers, the class lower and upper boundary, or the class lower and upper limits, and we end up with 35. And that means when we make our histogram, our first bar, we're going to put it at 35. And if it goes up one on the side over here, we go like one, two, three, four, whatever, all the way up until we need them all. That'd be our histogram. Wait, what do we do? Add these two numbers, divide by two, and that gives you the midpoint. <clears throat> now we could we could make the histogram like this and put 30, 40, 50, and put the bar going from 30 to 40 for that first one, but it's easier just to put the midpoints so that you don't have to put so many numbers on your histogram. Mm -hmm. See, that's what they, on this histogram, they put them on the sides, they put the numbers on the sides. Here they put the midpoints. So a frequency distribution chart looks like this. Again, you might have to add stuff to that, midpoint, cumulative frequency, all that other stuff that we added to it. And then you should be able to make a histogram from it. You have to put like a squiggly line, right? Yeah, for, for this, Make sure you know if hey if we're starting if we're starting our histogram at 30, then we're putting that little Z sort of thing there, showing that it's broke, and we didn't go all the way down to the bottom. You should always put that. <clears throat> you don't start at zero and work up in even or uh, consistent intervals. Then you should always do that to show that hey the graph's not always true. But if you look, this is one I stole from somebody. Did they do it there? Nope. No. no. So when you see it out in the real world, not everybody knows everything exactly right. No. No. Class, class width, class boundaries, these are all the things that we could have. The class boundaries, remember for the class boundaries, if we have our first class there that was 30 to 40, all you do to find the class boundaries is subtract a half from this one, add a half to that one. So the class boundaries for that class would be 29.5, 40.5. Relative frequency, remember relative frequency is the percents. That's where you take your frequency, how many you had in that class, and divide by the total number in all of your data. Cumulative frequency, cumulative frequency. If we were putting that in the chart, or cumulative frequency. Remember, it's going to start off with, if we're going down through here, if there's three here, two there, five there, four there, the cumulative frequency says how many are here or above. Well, that's only three. How many are at here or above? We well, just add that, and that's five. How many are at this point or above? Well, that's five plus five, which is ten. How many are here or above? We add that four, and it'd be fourteen. That's a cumulative frequency. So remember, with a uh, what is it, Lily? So with that, we start. Then it's going to be at like zero. Then it's going to go to here, then to here, then to here, then to here, then to here. This last one should be at the number of our total, which would be like 14 for that one. So it just tells how many pieces of data are from this point down, how many pieces of data are at this point, and down, so on and so on. 
frequency polygon. <clears throat> we didn't do a whole lot with the frequency polygon, but all it is, you put your numbers out here, so you probably put your boundaries, like 29.5, and then whatever the rest of them are all the way out through here. And actually, we don't, we're not at 29.5 yet. We could move that. And then you say, okay, I had two of that, two, one of that, one of that, three of that, one of that, whatever it is. And then out here I had zero of that, and you just connect them all. And it makes a sort of a shape there. It's a polygon. Be able to make a stem and leaf plot. Stem and leaf plots aren't too difficult. Whenever you make a stem and leaf plot, please make sure that you put a key. Notice on this one, no key. And again, I stole this one from somebody. I shouldn't have stole that one. Oh, I guess they do have a key. It's above here, isn't it? So I did steal a good one. That one's got their key right there. Put a key on it so everybody knows which numbers they are. So with the stem and leaf plot, you got your stems, you got your leaves. These are the stems. All these numbers are the leaves. Make sure that the leaves are in order. Six, seven, eight, zero, two, three, four, seven, seven, seven. So they got to go in numerical order. <coughs> We're looking at this one, and I pick this four right here. What number does that four stand for? Twenty-four. Sometimes instead of 24, if the key tells you, it might be like 2.4 or something. Just depends. Or it could be 0.24, or it could be 2400, or something like that. A back to back stem and leaf plot, something like this, compares potato chips to tortilla chips. Probably it well, says calories, so how many calories they have in it. Something like this one right here, if I look at this uh, and pick out that number, that stands for 150 on that side and so on on the other side. Remember with the stem and leaf plot, the whole purpose of the stem and leaf plot is if I do this, it looks like a histogram. It looks like a sideways histogram and we can tell most of our data falls in that range right there, in that area. Dot plot, probably the hardest one of all of them, right? Dot plot just uses dots above numbers. So if you're doing something like 30, 40, 50, 60, put a dot. Each time you see 30, put a dot above the 30. 40, put a dot above it, 50, put a dot above it for each one, 60, put a dot above it, so on, so on. <clears throat> pie chart, we didn't do a whole lot with pie charts, but be able to, uh, I don't know, can anybody see a percent on that? I can't see it. 2.76. So 2.4 percent is that one of them? Yeah. All right. 2.4 percent. If they told us that this represented a thousand, whatever it is, I don't know because I can't read any of it because it's too small print for me. If that told us that represented a thousand people, whatever those people are, and we wanted to figure out how much the two, the piece of the pie that's 2.4 represents then we just change this to a decimal, bump it over two places, so 0 0.024, and we times it by 1,000, and that's going to tell us how many people, which one's 2.4, what color? Uh, I thought it was a little more. I think it's like this yeah, one. That one. So that tells us that how many people would fall in that slice of the pie right there. That's the main thing that we did with those. Pareto chart. A Pareto chart is like a bar graph, except 
it always goes from the most to the least. It always goes most to least. Scatter plot. Hopefully you know what a scatter plot is. We'll do a whole lot more. We didn't do a whole lot with a scatter plot in this chapter, but we will as the year goes along. Scatter plots just got points scattered everywhere. Sort of give you an idea. And off a scatter plot, what you could do is take a line of fit, stick it in there, and we can sort of make an estimate. If your weight is 55, we can come over here and figure out that the number of days should be, or whatever the weight is, the number of days should be somewhere around in there, 63, 64. Time series chart, time series chart always has time along the horizontal axis. So it always has time along that bottom. So if you wanted to figure out uh, for 11.3, you can figure that it was about 1,250, whatever this chart shows. Uh, be able to find the mean. When I put mean on here, don't forget that Mean doesn't always have to be mu, it could be x bar. That's still the sum of all the x's divided by, uh, instead of big n, it's just divided by little n. Remember, this is for a sample. x bar is for a sample, and mu is for a population. How do you find the median? Give me one key word for median. Middle. middle number. What if there's not a middle number? What do you do with the two that are there? Subtract and divide by. Not subtract. Adam. Add them and divide by two. How do you find the most? Or how do you find the mode? The most. It's the one that's the most. Be able to find weighted means again for what and I didn't probably didn't put a whole lot on there but a weighted mean would be you take each thing and times it by the weight like our grade in here test count is 70 percent so you take each of your test grades times it by 70 and take your homework grades which is 30 percent time so you take each homework grade times it by 30 percent add them all together and then divide by 100, which is our overall percentage. And the mean of a frequency distribution, this X right here, if you're doing a frequency distribution chart, if they're not all separate numbers, then what you'd have to do is use the midpoint for each class. We didn't, we didn't do a whole lot with that, but it is something that you do need to know as we go throughout the year. very important. This one sort of important. This one uh, probably not a whole lot dealing with it. What's bimodal mean? Two modes. Two modes. Two modes. Uh, just some of these I just put on here just so that you remember. That's the mean 
of the population. What's sigma? Standard deviation. Standard deviation of the population. What's the other thing that stands for standard deviation? Just S. What's this symbol mean? Sum. All right, sum, add them all. X bar. I don't know, I must not have been able to find the X bar because I wrote it out instead of, I don't know how I could have X bar on one slide and then have to write it out on the next slide. But What's an outlier? Sets off cycle. All right. Outside of the data, outside of the rest of data. We didn't talk a whole lot about a gap, but a gap would just go along with an outlier if there's, no, it doesn't have to go along with an outlier. It could just be something like if we were doing a histogram and maybe the histogram looks like this. Yeah, you might want to watch this closely because some of these tests that we take like this symbols test and stuff, there'll be something that looks like this. That there is just a gap. Still a histogram, that's just a gap. Symmetric graph, what's it look like? What is it? It's like even or is it even all the way across? No, but it's high. Something like that, that's symmetric. What's uniform? That's where it's all the same. That's where it's all the same. All the way across. Skewed left. What's it going to look like? It's going to have a tail on the left side. So if it was a if it was a histogram, it might look something like this. Where it's got that tail going out that way. And what's skewed right? The tail towards the right side. These are all just the different things. Remember variance. Sigma squared or S squared, that's variance, depending on if you're dealing with population or sample. Standard deviation is sigma or S. Mean is mu or, I'll guarantee somewhere on this slide, there's a bar that's just randomly stuck somewhere because it's missing from my X bar right here. It's supposed to be an X bar. For some reason, they just like to go places. So that's an X bar there. Number of entries, if it's a population that's a big N or capital N, sample is just little n. Deviation, X minus mu or X minus X bar. Then the sum of the squares and the sum of the squares, remember the symbol for sum of squares is SS with the subscript X. And those are all the different symbols and Greek letters and everything that we covered during the chapter. <clears throat> How's Friday going to affect you guys as far as any of you leave early? Leave early. Because my transitions class, so probably I'm sure that. But Lily, you'd never ever do anything like that, would you? Formulas for variance. Formulas for variance, again, <clears throat> you can plug this stuff into your calculator to find the variance. Remember, this one's for a population, though. 
This one is for a sample. So the calculator will do this stuff for you. But if you need to figure it out, if you don't have a list, then you need to know the formulas. Because the only way the calculator can do it for you is if you put the list into the calculator. If they don't tell you the list, they just tell you the mean, how many numbers are in the set, and which number you're dealing with, then you have to use the formula. And again, I'm not sure, I never have understood why for a population, use every member of the data set that you're dealing with. For a sample, do n minus 1. Just makes it closer to the variance. How do you find the standard deviation if you find the variance first? What do you do to get the variance or get the standard deviation? Take the square root of that. So that's probably what the next slide is. Standard deviation, just take the square root of those two answers you just got. This is if you're doing it out sort of longhand. If you're doing it out longhand, then you find the variance first, and then you find the standard deviation. If you're using your calculator, if you're putting in a list on your calculator, it's going to tell you the standard deviation. And to find the variance, you'd have to square the standard deviation. Remember, on the calculator, population standard deviation looks like this. It's got sigma with x. And a sample standard deviation has s with x. Just make sure you don't get confused and do, you know, Maybe they tell you the standard deviation for a problem and they want you to find the variance. Well, if they tell you the standard deviation, then you're going to square it to find the variance. If they tell you the variance and want you to find the standard deviation, then you've got to take the square root. Just make sure you don't get it backwards. Empirical rule for this, all I would draw for empirical rule, we'll just redraw it right here. You've got your normal curve, your bell shape or your bell curve. Right here in the middle is the mean. What percent of the numbers fall in this area? 34. 34%. How about in this area? 34%. How about in that area? 13.5% this area. 0.5%, that area, we'll say about 2.5, about 2.5%, 2.4 is actually pretty closer to whatever, some, something close to that. That's your empirical rule. Be able to use that, so if they say you have 170 people that you're interviewing and they want to know what part or how many of the people should fall in this range, then you just take 170 times 0.68 and that would tell you how many people is going to fall in there. Be able to use, what do you say this guy's name is? Chevy Chase. Be able to use his theorem. Chevy Chase. Remember, it's just, K just stands for the number of standard deviations. Most of this wasn't real hard. If it's <coughs> zero standard deviations, it's nothing. If it's one, you end up just at zero. And then when we go to two, one minus one over four, that's 75% or three-fourths. Then we go to three and it ended up being like 89%. So 
so on, so on. Nothing really hard about that. And uh, you may have to use that just to find the percentage or something, but it's nothing really difficult. <coughs> Be able to find quartiles. What's quartiles tell you again? Four parts. What's the IQR? Inner quartile range. And remember, inner quartile range is just the third. I don't know why I did that. Quartile three minus quartile one. I'll get out of the way and let you write a little bit. C scores, be able to do those. Did you steal my test? No. Why would you do that? I thought I'd been nice to you. Does anybody have the formula for coefficient of variation? Somewhere. Right there somewhere. So we could write it down for this. CB. <coughs> Should just put on the last set of notes. Sigma could be S. When you make a box and whisker plot, it wasn't too difficult. What do what things do we need to know? Five number summary, is that what we call it? Z scores, what we were just doing, X minus mu or X minus X bar, and they're defined by sigma or S, depending on what you're dealing with. What makes something unusual? It's um, past outlier. If it's two to three. All right, so two to three or three to more than two standard deviations. Above or below is unusual. More than three standard deviations is very unusual. Or when we were dealing with percents, it was five percent or lower, unusual, or ninety-five percent or higher was unusual. 